Welcome to Baptist for Africa, a fundamental Baptist church planting mission in Africa. We are passionately committed to Jesus' great commission by reaching Africa through the gospel and making disciples all across the continent. God is doing great things in this ministry with multitudes of precious souls converted and countless lives changed by the preaching of the Bible. Join us now as we listen to a message from God's Word. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This was the main message of the greatest man ever born of women, according to Jesus. And John the Baptist, I want you to learn this morning, was a very serious man. John the Baptist was a no-nonsense man. We learn from Mark chapter 1, verse 2, that he had a sober or a serious commission. In verse 3, that he had a sober call. In verse 4 and 5, that he had a sober conduct. And finally, what I'm going to talk about this morning, in verse 6, that he had sober clothing. Look down at Mark 1, 6 with me. And the Bible says, And John was clothed with camel's hair and with the girdle of a skin about his loins. There was something profoundly peculiar about this prophet of the Lord, about the way that he dressed, such to the point that when Matthew and when Mark are discussing him in their Gospels respectively, they point out very clearly what he was wearing. Now the Bible doesn't do this with almost any other character, but for John it seemed to be so necessary to point out what he was wearing that Matthew and Mark both did it. And therefore, what these evangelists so-called, or what these inspired authors are doing, are putting a spotlight on the garments of John the Baptist. And I'm going to show you today that there are three things about the way that John dressed that should define the way that all people who are Christians, particularly today, those who call themselves Baptists, dress. Also, we learn in the Gospel later on that Jesus, not merely the authors of the New Testament, but Jesus himself was so astounded, so impressed with the way that John wore clothing that it says in Matthew 11, I read, But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. Here, when Jesus is talking about the greatness of John, one of the articles of his greatness was the manner of clothing that he was wearing, the kind of things that he put on himself. And therefore, let me ask you a question. Let's suppose that you were in the position of John the Baptist this morning. Let's imagine that as you were coming to church, you supposed that you had a call from God like John the Baptist did, to be a herald of the King of Kings, to be an ambassador who is going to bring people to Christ right before his coming. How would you dress? How would you attire yourself? What kind of clothing would you have put on this morning? Therefore, I say that we who style ourselves as Baptists should not merely have sound doctrine, but we should also have sober dress. Turn to the book of Titus, chapter number 2. Many people, after they hear what I'm going to say, or before they hear it, judging beforehand, which is the fools, answering a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame unto him. The first thing they're going to respond to me, which I must at once address, where does the Bible tell us that we are supposed to dress in the way that you're telling us this morning? Before I therefore tell you what the Bible says, let me just give you the principle from the scripture about how you're supposed to dress always but especially when it comes to church. And that's really what I'm going to focus on this morning. How should you be dressed? What clothing should you have when you come to church? Titus chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. There's the sound doctrine I talked of. Verse number 2, and the doctrine is oftentimes associated with the deeds. So he says that the aged men, notice it says, be sober. The first thing he points out about the aged men is that they're supposed to be sober. Now, the word sober does not mean unaffected by alcohol or drugs, although that's an extension of what it could mean and it has come to mean today. Certainly, someone who is drinking alcohol or doing drugs is not sober. But when the Bible says to be sober, it's actually saying something more general. It's saying that God wants us to be serious people. God does not want us to be casual, lackadaisical, unconcerned, disinterested. That is not how Christians are supposed to be. 
It says the aged men, the old men are supposed to be sober among other qualities. Look what he says of the aged women. The aged women likewise. Likewise how? They're supposed to be sober just like the aged men. And then look what it tells us first thing that the aged women are supposed to teach or the old women are supposed to teach the young women, verse number four, that they may teach the young women to be sober, that is to be serious. And then when he wants to finally address the last category of people in the church, having talked to the old men, having talked to the old women, having talked to the young women by means of the old women, now he addresses the young men, verse six. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Did you notice that four times Paul, as he's writing to Titus, says that when you're teaching in church, I want you to make sure that the primary category of virtues that you're expressing to people is that they be serious people who take the word of God and take God serious. He goes on in the same chapter and says in verse number 12 that Jesus Christ taught us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live. And the first one is interesting, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This morning, I want you to ask yourself one question. Am I dressed for church in a serious way? If people looked at me right now, sitting in this church service, would they say, this person takes God seriously? This person thinks that God is important. This person thinks that this place is a holy place that they ought to reverence. God says, reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. He didn't give you a caveat. He didn't give you an exception. And so that's what the question you're supposed to be asking yourself this morning. Are you sober? Are you serious? How does God expect us to dress? Well, I would simply say, just to kind of summarize everything before I even begin, God wants you to be a serious Christian. And therefore, this morning, I'm going to look to the greatest man born of women in the words of Jesus to see how he dressed, and then we're going to learn lessons from him. I remind you that the first thing that God did for Adam and Eve after announcing the curses upon them was to actually clothe them. Adam and Eve sewed to themselves fig leaves of aprons, uh, uh, aprons of fig leaves. God didn't think that their clothing was appropriate. God didn't think their clothing was right. God didn't think that they were putting the right kind of clothing on. So what did God do immediately after telling them about the curses that have come because of the sin that they've committed? Now he immediately perhaps slays an animal and clothes them with skins and clothe them, the scripture says in Genesis 3. Therefore, we too are supposed to teach transgressors God's ways and convert sinners to Christ. And as we do, we are supposed to, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, cause them to know how they are, among other things, to be clothed properly. Today, therefore, what I really want to put forward is not just the idea of how you're supposed to dress at all times, which is true and important, what I'm going to say, but really how you dress when you come to the house of God. If you were glad when they said unto you, let us go into the house of the Lord this morning, you should have also been serious as they did it. And you should have remembered that our God is a consuming fire and our God is a holy God and you can't treat him however you want. If you don't believe me, ask Nadab and Abihu who were killed by fire when they offered to God what he didn't command. And therefore I wouldn't be surprised if certain people die in this church, especially after hearing a sermon like this, when they decide to flagrantly come to church in a clothing that he does not approve of, that God does not accept. We do not well, every man here this day at Bible Baptist Church, doing whatsoever is right in his own eyes, wearing whatever clothes appeal to him when you come to God's house. And therefore this morning I want to save you with fear, hating even your garment which has been spotted by the flesh, and take away from you the old sin garment that you've been wearing, the worldly fashion of this world which passes away, and instead give you good garments that you are going to wear by Christ. Him, what he would clothe us in, what he wants us. If Jesus will dress us in heaven with white robes, why can he not dress us here on the earth? If Jesus can command us how we are supposed to walk and to live and to please God, why can he not command us what kind of clothing we're supposed to wear? And therefore, this morning, I'm going to intentionally offend and step on the toes of people sitting right in front of me. And I don't care. To all who become convicted by the things that I'm going to say, and I'm going to use extremely harsh language, according to the power which the Lord has given me for your edification, not for your destruction. Everyone who gets convicted, instead of running away, screaming, putting your fingers in your ears and la 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 and you don't want to hear why don't you just change why don't you just be converted 
Why don't you just get different clothes and begin to dress the way that God wants you to? I say to you what Jacob said to his wives, change your garments, change your clothes. The kind of clothing you wear very often is not acceptable to God. And so to illustrate this, I want to have the ushers bring out two of our very faithful church members who have been coming here for a couple years now. Both of these church members uh, have been here for a long time, and uh, I got to know both of them very well. You know, one of them, uh, he, every time he comes to church, he always comes with a pen, paper, his Bible in his hand. He's always, you know, focusing and intently listening. But the other church member, I'm sorry to say it in his presence, but the other church member doesn't seem to take God very seriously. He doesn't seem to care much about God's house. And so I'm going to talk to them here before you in the presence of all of you, and we can see if we can, you know, commend the good example of one and uh, probably teach us something from the other one. The Bible tells us that we are supposed to reverence God's sanctuary. What does it mean to revere God's sanctuary? That means to take it to be holy. That means that when you come before God's house, it's a different kind of place. It's a place that you treat with tremendous degree of fear and trembling as you come to God's house. And it's amazing how when people come to the house of God, when people come to church, the Bible says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them, Jesus said. They did not know that Jesus was there, even as the woman did not know that it was Jesus who she was speaking to, supposing it to be the gardener. They didn't know that Christ Jesus was coming to their church. They didn't know that Christ wanted them to dress in a particular way. And therefore, as a result, they put on however they felt well. But that is not right, that is not good, that is not godly, it is not sober, it is not serious. And therefore, according to the Bible, there's a particular way that God wants you to dress, particularly when you come to church, and there's a particular way that God does not want you to dress. There are many things I can say to you today about what God does not want you to wear. There are many verses in the Bible that talk about things that we're not supposed to wear and things that we are supposed to wear. The kind of clothing God expects from us and the kind of clothing He expects us not to have. However, today I'm going to focus particularly on being someone who is a serious Christian. I could talk about modesty, I could talk about gender roles in the clothing you wear, but today we're going to talk about being a serious person. So here we have one of our very faithful church members. His name is John. Good morning, John. How are you? John, you're looking pretty smart today. He's shy. Don't worry. He doesn't speak very much. Well, I'm so glad you came to church this morning. John, I, I like how the way you're dressed. Oh, where'd you get those shoes? Oh, uh, you got them pretty cheaply. Well, that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. And wow, you're even dressed nicer than me, John. You look really serious about this church service. You can respond. He, he, he's shy. He doesn't want to talk in front of people. He's not used to being in front of people. Well, we appreciate you so much for coming to church, John. Uh, God bless you during the church service. And uh, this is, oh, uh, this is, uh, what's, what's his name? Oh, Jack. Jack, I can't remember, who was it that preached the gospel to you? It's okay, Jack, you don't need to run away. Who was it that preached, oh, okay, oh, I, I don't, okay. Well, Jack, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. Uh, what made you think that coming to church looking like a gangster, like a rebellious teenager, like a bum on the side of the street was a good idea? Now, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm glad you're here at church, you can hear the word of God being preached. But Jack, don't you think that the way you're dressed is not right? Don't you see there's like, you know, at least seven abominations about the way that you're dressed right now? <laughs> TikTok some kind of a, a wicked, filthy, disgusting social media site. Have you been uh, involved in things like that? Hey, you, you don't need to play on your phone during the church service, Jack. You should be focusing and paying attention to the church and listening to the word of God being preached. A t-shirt? What kind of a person are you? Wearing a t-shirt to church? And, oh, your underwear is exposed, Jack. <laughs> Didn't your mother ever teach you how you're supposed to wear a belt? Oh, skinny jeans, jeans with holes in them and all these designs all over them. What kind of a fool are you? You look like a complete clown dressed at church today. Did you think that God would accept you the way that you came? Did you think that God likes the way that you dress? Jack? The Bible says that well, we know that what things serve the law say that say it to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That's why Jack doesn't want to speak right now. His mouth has been stopped by the very clear word of God and slippers. Yellow slippers, Mikey, just do it. Just do what? Just sin by coming to church in whatever way you think fit? God doesn't approve of the way you're dressed, Jack. 
God doesn't like the way that you're dressed. This is not biblical. This is not sober. This is not righteous. This is not godly. Oh, well, the Bible says, come as you are. Well, Jack, that's not a Bible verse. I'm sorry to tell you. How many times have you read the Bible cover to cover, Jack? It must have been never because of the way you're dressed. Anyway, we'll come back to you, Jack. This is, biblically speaking, absurd. If you come to dress church dressed like this. Okay, look back at our text then, Mark chapter number one. And I want to tell you from the great Baptist how to dress as a Baptist. There are three things I'm going to tell you right now. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that John the Baptist dressed professionally. When John the Baptist attired himself for his office, for his mission, for his work, he made sure that he was dressing in a professional way. He made sure that everybody who saw him saw him in a presentable way. And therefore, our clothing should be formal. The second thing I'm going to tell you is that John the Baptist dressed practically. He didn't dress in clothing that hindered him from doing the work that he wanted. He actually dressed in clothing that made himself amenable to the work that he was doing, made it simpler, made it easier, but above all, made it to actually go through. And therefore, our clothing should be functional. John the Baptist, thirdly, dressed plainly. John the Baptist was not a rich man. He was a very ascetic person who lived in the wilderness very often, a very rural man in the deserts till the day of his showing to Israel, even after. And so John the Baptist was a plain man. He was somebody who didn't have the extravagances and very expensive things of life. But nevertheless, John the Baptist was a godly person, and therefore our clothing should be frugal. God, therefore, I'm going to prove to you from the Bible, God wants you to be, when you dressed for church especially, but even everywhere, God wants you to be professionally dressed, he wants you to be practically dressed, and he wants you to be plainly dressed. You should be formal, functional, and frugal in your clothing. Number one, John the Baptist dressed professionally. He was someone who, as he presented himself, people took him seriously because of the way that he was dressed. Now, look again at Mark 1 and verse number 6. And I want to point out to you that John the Baptist's clothing is very distinct. It's very unique. It's very interesting. And this is actually one of the things that catches many children's eye as they read the text. Or it catches many new believers' minds. And it gives you a very nice picture. That John was clothed in camel's hair and wore a leathern girdle about his loins. That means that John was wearing a very rough garment on the outside, and John the Baptist was wearing a belt or a leather girdle, leather made of animal skin, uh, around his waist. This is how John the Baptist presented himself. And that's therefore how we, not in the same way, but in the same principle, should present ourselves. You might think to yourself, why would John dress like this? Jesus certainly didn't dress like this. People made distinctions between the way that Jesus lived and the way that John the Baptist lived. And this is certainly not how most people live. This seems to be something very unique to John, uh, unless you understand many passages in the Old Testament. For example, in the book of Zechariah, it talks about a man wearing a rough garment to deceive because the prophets were so clad that they would live very ascetically. They would perhaps dress much like John is here dressed. And so what John is actually doing is he's identifying himself with a long line of Old Testament prophets by the way that he's dressing. And he shows people, not merely, oh, Jack, he's fainting because of the word of God. <laughs> According to the Bible, John the Baptist was dressing in a way that was consonant with his mission. He wanted people to see that he was a prophet indeed. And therefore, he dressed, if you will, in an Elijah-like capacity. Turn to 2 Kings chapter number 1. When you see the connection between John the Baptist and Elijah, you will at once remember the story, 2 Kings chapter number 1, you'll remember the story of Mark chapter 1 where it tells us how he's dressed. And this is a very fascinating connection to see. The first, no, you can leave Jack. You know, eh, he's not going to listen anyway. Uh, he's beyond the hope. <laughs> but uh, 2 Kings chapter number 1, let me read to you from Luke chapter 1 to show you the connection between John the Baptist and Elijah. The Bible says, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, or Elijah. So John the Baptist comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, of course, John the Baptist was not literally Elijah. He, I was asked, Are you Elijah? And he said, No, I am not. So, John the Baptist is not literally Elijah. But rather, John the Baptist is coming in the same spirit and coming in the same power. He has a similar mission to Elijah, which things we cannot now speak particularly. Uh, 2 Kings chapter number 1, 
Let me show you the uniform of Elijah. Verse number seven. And he said unto them, what manner the king, trying to figure out who it was that prophesied this horrible thing against him, what manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? Now notice again how they describe the man, not by what he says, not by you know, things that he does, but by the way he's dressed. It says, he was an hairy man, they answered, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said immediately, he recognized, it is Elijah the Tishbite. He says, this person must have been that prophet of old who's coming and preaching so negatively against all of the kings and all of the people of this country. And so therefore, John the Baptist was, if you will, putting on the uniform of Elijah. He was dressed like Elijah. That way people would see the similarity between his office and the other. Just like businesses, administrations, governments often have uniforms for people in different capacities, so the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, has a uniform that he wanted John the Baptist to wear. And notice, therefore, also how easily identifiable Elijah was from his clothing and how easily identifiable John the Baptist must have been from his clothing, too. You would have no time wasted trying to guess who this man is preaching to us by the Jordan River. This is none other than John the Baptist. Therefore, our clothing should, like John, be professional, have a professional purpose, and we should dress formally. I want you to see again that his clothing matched his message. And ask yourself that question. Is the way that I'm dressed right now matching the seriousness and the severity of the word of God, of the people of God, of the God of gods who is right now present with us? Let's imagine, let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine that someone were to randomly come in here and have no idea, they don't see the sign, whatever, they don't know it's Sunday morning. They come in here and they begin to ask, what kind of a place is this? What, what are we in right now? What kind of a, a, a gathering is this? Suppose right now that somebody comes into this assembly. Suppose they wander in here and they ask themselves, not knowing it's a Sunday morning, not seeing the sign, thinking it's a church, they immediately begin to ask, what kind of an assembly am I at right now? What kind of a place am I in right now? And he goes and says, you know what I can do? I can look at the way everyone's dressed. That'll tell me what kind of a place this is. And he looks and he sees Jax. What is he immediately going to conclude? This must be a bar. This must be a dance club. Maybe it's a library for the disenfranchised. But he would never in a million years conclude that this is a church, maybe a Pentecostal church, but he would never in a million years conclude that this is a Baptist church. Never. And therefore, your clothing, if you're like Jack and not like John, does not match your message either. Is it so strange to think that God expects that we dress in a particular way when we come to church, when in the Old Covenant, God's priests and God's Levites were dressed in a particular way that they couldn't dress however they wanted in the sanctuary, they couldn't dress however they wanted in the tabernacle, can say, well, that's the Old Testament. The Bible says in the, in the New Testament that we are priests unto God. The Bible says that we are a holy priesthood in the New Testament era. And therefore, your clothes, though they, of course, should not be the same degree uh, uh, or the same way as the priests and Levites of the Old Testament, yet they should be modeled after the same principle that I'm going to have clothing for glory and for beauty when I come before the Lord. God deserves to be honored by us in our apparel at church. And let me say with as much force as I can, God is greatly, greatly dishonored and greatly, greatly displeased by people who dress like Mr. Jack right over here, by people who dress in a casual, bummish, just like he got out of bed or something. And this is not how you're supposed to dress when you come to church. God says, how should my name be polluted among the Gentiles, among the heathen? And you pollute God's name when you dress like this for church. Those who dress casually and not formally, who look like a beggar rather than a parishioner, are not fit, clothed, fitly clothed to come to God's house. Not that they can't come to God's house, but that they are dishonoring God by their doing it. And the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. 
And it is, you're, you're the reason why someone might not come to church. You're the reason why someone might not come back to church. You're the reason why somebody will think that texting in church, eating in church, and doing all these uh, uh, dishonorable things during a church service is okay. You're the reason, perhaps, why they think that walking in front of the pulpit is okay. You, it's your sin that has caused all of these things because they see this place is not serious. Therefore, I can behave however I want, and I can dress however I want too. And you have, if, you're, if, if it's not a sin itself, you've caused others to sin. That's for sure. Now, Jack is dressed in a really terrible way this morning. But one time we had a church service, and there was a guy who came to church dressed even worse than, yes, even worse than Jack. He came to church. I am not kidding. Many of you are here, and you can testify. We can have witnesses. <laughs> he came to church with a white sleeveless vest. Oh, Shorts right above his knee and flip flops. What? <laughs> Who do you think? Are you some kind of a clown? What is going on right now? I, I was beside myself. I, was, I thought I had to rub my eyes and pinch myself. I'm awake. I'm not dreaming. Because if I was dreaming, it would be a nightmare. How in the world can someone dress like that for church? Here's why because they don't take God seriously at all because they don't care about God, because they don't take God with any sobriety. They do not have the virtue of sobriety at all. Let me tell you something. When people, all throughout history, and even in biblical history, even today, right now, when people go to appear before powerful people, potentates, uh, heads of state, whatever, when they go to appear before those people, how do they dress? Are they allowed to come in before the president? of Uganda? Are they allowed to come in before the President of the United States dressed like Jack? Are they allowed to do that? No. They can't even come within, a, you know, a uh, hundred yards of the guy, or you know what a yard is. They can't even come within a hundred meters of the guy. There's no way they would let you shake his hand, greet him dressed like this, or dressed like many people do very frequently, even in church here. Let me show you from the Bible quickly. Joseph. Joseph was a very godly man. And therefore, when Joseph was in prison, of course, he had no ability to clean himself. He had no ability to dress nicely. He couldn't even shave himself. But when Joseph is called to come in before Pharaoh, the Bible very particularly tells us what he did in Genesis 41. It tells us that Joseph basically prepared himself. He shaved himself, and he changed his clothes. He changed his raiment, the text says. Did you notice that as Joseph is coming before a king, a worldly king, Pharaoh, he is changing his clothes. You say, that's a lot of time to get ready for church in the morning like that, like Mr. John over here. Well, John is following in the footsteps, not only of John the Baptist, but of Joseph. Because Joseph was a person who, knowing he's coming in before a great king, Pharaoh, king of the world, basically, he is going to dress up nicely. So it is the same with you coming to church. You say, well, you're not a king, Jesse. I am. The Bible says I'm a king, and you're sitting among kings and queens right now. Did you know that? Well, let's forget us little K kings. There is a capital K, king of kings, here right now, too. Because where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Let's imagine, offer it now to your governor, to your president of 70. Would he be uh, pleased with you or accept your person? Let's imagine that I told you last night, well, 70 is going to be here tomorrow morning. He's going to visit us in church. What would you do, most of you who are dressed in this way? Well, not everyone, of course, but many people. You would go out and do everything possible to dress at least like this, probably like this, right? Oh, I'm going to meet the president. He's going to be in our church. Uh, but someone greater than Museveni is here right now as we're speaking. And you are dressed like this? What? <laughs> Have you lost your mind? Are you insane? Are you crazy? Or all of the above? This is not right what you do. This is not godly what you do. This is not pleasing to God what you do. You're still in your prison garments of sin and worldliness and worldly fashion. And therefore, God himself, if, if, if the president of this country, which is a small country, very little influence on the world scene, if the president of this country would ever accept you that way, how much more would God not accept you? God says, I am a great king, saith the Lord, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. You say, I'm going to meet the king of kings today. I'm going to be coming before the king right now. That's exactly how you should always come to church. How can it be that Solomon, in all of his glory, the richest king who ever lived, he has ministers 
who the Queen of Sheba, she notices, are attired very nicely. It was one of the things that impressed her, that made her lose her breath, and made her have no more questions, and made her realize that the half of the wisdom was not told me. And she says, the way that these people, their apparel, the way that they're dressed, and yet a greater than Solomon is here, Jesus Christ, and yet you will dress in the way that you think right, rightly. You look like, a, again, a rebellious teenager, like a child. The Bible says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Ye are yet carnal, dressed the way you are, coming to God's house particularly on a Sunday morning. What? Is this the way that God deserves to be served? Is this the kind of offering that he, to tread his courts and to step over God in the way that you're dressed? Woe unto you! casually dressed and carelessly attired at church. Hypocrites, if you were going to a marriage, particularly if you were going to be married, you would be dressed up very nicely. Woe unto you, casually dressed and carelessly attired. Hypocrites, if you were going to a funeral, particularly of a very significant and important person or relative, you would be dressed up at least like I am. Woe unto you, hypocrites, who in your fake churches would dress up like John and not like Jack. And you see people coming dressed up to Kayanja's church, Kikandi's church like this. Of course, people come like that too. But I'm saying many people are hypocrites. And then when they come to this church, they dress like this. What? What kind of a fool are you? What kind of a clown are you? Have you not learned Christ? The Bible says you have not so learned Christ. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. If a bride will be very gorgeously attired for her husband on the bridal day, on the marriage day, how much more the bride of Christ, the church, should be for her king, her husband, Christ, at, at his house on the Lord's day. Such women say, it's my day, my marriage day. This is the Lord's day. This is not your day to dress however you want. This is how Christ uh, it, it commands, and he is the one that could demand and, and expect us. Will the children of Satan in their fake churches roll around and rave dressed like this? and you will come to God's house, the general assembly and church of the firstborn, those who are written in heaven, dressed like this, dressed like this fool, dressed like this clown, dressed like this child. Enough with your nonsense. Enough with give us somebody who actually reveres and actually fears God and trembles before him as they come to church. Give us a John the Baptist on especially a Sunday who dresses formally. Number two, there's a second thing about John's clothing that you need to learn. And that is that John the Baptist dressed practically. He did not merely dress professionally, he also dressed practically. That means that your clothing should be functional. I want you to notice the serviceability of his clothing. It's not just that John the Baptist looks like an Old Testament prophet, namely Elijah and other prophets. It is moreover that John the Baptist's clothing serves important purposes for him. So for example, uh, John the Baptist, I told you, lived an itinerant life. He was somebody who very likely was traveling around, baptizing people. He was somebody who probably didn't have a certain dwelling place. He was probably somebody who, uh, again, had very, very little money. And therefore, John the Baptist was somebody who, when he purchases garments, he's going to make sure that they are all serving a very important purpose. Let me explain to you some of the functions of his clothing. Remember, camel's hair and a leathern girdle. Some of the functions that could have been important. One of them, of course, is that he's in the desert. The desert, as you'll know, can get very hot and very cold. Very hot in the day, very cold in the evening. Now, interestingly, camel's hair has what are called thermostatic properties about it. That's, of course, why camels have it. That way they can endure the hot and the cold. And so camel's hair clothing allows you to be cooler in the day and warmer in the evening. Isn't that interesting? And therefore, John the Baptist has a practical garment. Also remember that John the Baptist was, of course, he's called the Baptist, baptizing people at the Jordan River. And this also is one of the properties of camel's hair. Camel's hair is water resistant. It uh, is, uh, has that property about it. So John the Baptist's clothing would not get uh, in the way it usually would with most other clothings uh, to be you know, standing in the water all day. He needs something that's more water resistant. And of course, John the Baptist had a girdle. He had a belt, which I'll talk more particularly about in just a moment. And John the Baptist, therefore, was girded. That means that his clothing was tightly fitted on him. Not so tight that it's uncomfortable, but tight to the point where it's not flowing around, to the point where he is not productive. And finally, what you might not have known, John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey. Now, 
I don't know about you, but eating wild honey, honey does not grow on trees. It grows in hives by the bees. And in order, ask any bear, in order to get honey, what do you have to do? You have to go to the beehive. The beehive does not have times where it's not being protected. It is ferociously protected by bees, all times. So if you're going to get wild honey, and the Bible specifically says wild, if you're going to get wild honey, he doesn't go to a store and buy it. He has to go to the beehive and get it. That means that John the Baptist had to fight with bees to eat honey. And therefore he needs clothing like camel's hair, which is very thick, that the bees very likely, at least in his garment, probably could not pierce through. And so he would be, for the most part, protected from the sting of those bees. Therefore, John the Baptist's clothing served a practical purpose as he dressed functionally. God, therefore, I think in the exact same way, wants us to dress practically. He wants us to dress functionally. Let me give you a couple examples. But let me give you one very big example that is an epidemic, not merely in this country. We can call it a pandemic because it goes on uh, wherever I've been. I've seen it all over the world. Men, and I'm talking both to men and women, but now I speak particularly to the men, men who do not wear belts and their trousers sag down like this, exposing their undergarments and all the rest. This is crazy. Come on, Jack. You can't just stand up for a few minutes and pay attention. Come on, Jack. Maybe one of the ushers can help Jack out. He needs to, hey, wake up, wake up. Wake up, Jack. Time to stand up and, and, and display your shame to all the congregation and show them what kind of an idiot you are coming and dressing like this. Now, I want you to notice something about Jack's clothing. He doesn't have a belt on. And he's intentionally pulling his trousers down. Why people do this is really a mystery to me and to anyone else. I've heard different things about what it could have been, different people telling me different things about it. It's not really important. The point is that you look like a fool. The point is that you look like a clown. What stupidity, what shame to pull your trousers down on your, they're supposed to be on your loins like this, not like his are right there. The Bible tells us in the book of Job, God says to Job, gird up thy loins like a man. And that's exactly what I say to you today. Gird up your loins like a man. God bless you, I see you there in the congregation. <laughs> Gird up your loins like a man. Do not be this fool who looks just like Jack instead. Here's what you need to do after this church service. You need to go out and buy yourself a good old belt like this. Maybe not this exact kind, but something like this. A belt that you can wear. This is called a belt, B-E-L-T, okay? You're supposed to put this around your waist and your trousers are supposed to be like Mr. John here. You can't really see, but they're supposed to be at your hip like this. Not like this idiot <laughs> down here. What in the world? This guy's lost his mind, or he never had it in the first place. And that's how you're supposed to wear your trousers. I know it's kind of strange. This is what you teach little children how to dress, but that's exactly what you are when you dress like Jack. You're a child, and you have not learned and grown up in the Lord. Let me tell you that if John the Baptist were here right now, I guarantee I'd be getting very loud amens from him. Because John the Baptist was somebody who dressed in a very practical way by wearing that belt. So it was said by Elijah, of Elijah. It says in verse 1846, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. I noticed particularly that he, before running, that is before doing something very strenuous and before laboring, he girds up his loins. He already had the belt on, it was already there, but he tightens it to make sure that the loose flowing garment that he was wearing as a prophet perhaps uh, other times, he would uh, put it within and that way it wouldn't hinder him from running. You cannot labor very effectively, certainly you cannot run very speedily when your trousers are constantly drooping down. Now, how hilarious it is to me when I'm, I mean, you can experience it too when you're walking on the road and you see someone running and they're dressed like this. You look like a complete idiot. You're a fool. Why don't you just pick your trousers up and put a belt on? That will solve all your problems right there. Your garment is not functional. Your garment is not practical. The reason why there are these little lines here is to put a belt through it, right? 
<laughs> what in the world? Have you, like, literally, it, 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 he could have done it. I mean, these, the, the way they designed these, I mean, let me talk about the skinny jeans in just a moment. I'll come back to that in just a second. But here's the craziness about this, okay? Jack came to church this morning, and guess what? Not only will he walk around town like this, that's one thing. That's stupidity, foolishness, evil, not serious sin. But he came to church like this, you see. What kind of a fool are you to come to church like, of all things? Maybe you, I'm not saying it's okay for you to dress like this on a normal off day. Uh, I think that's wrong. I think it's stupid. But at least when you came to God's house, would you not revere his sanctuary? His trousers falling down, his underwear exposed. What an idiot. What a fool. And the only thing that you should do when you see people like that is you should laugh at them. And we should develop a culture where you see you laugh at people. What in the world? You, do, you have not uh, at all learned what it means to be a mature adult when you're dressed like this at all. And do you think that Jesus walked around Palestine like that? Do you think that Jesus, as he was preaching, and blessed are the peace, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Do you think that's how Jesus was? And yet that's how you are. Because you're not dressed like Jesus. You're not dressed in a way that's practical. You're not dressed in a way that God expects you to dress. No, you do not well here this day. What a joke. There are other things. It's not just that. But it's other things about people's garments that are not practical. And therefore, not like the Baptist. And therefore, you could never be considered to be the greatest man born of women, nor a great person. Uh, if you do not dress like John the Baptist. There are things that people wear that are impractical and therefore, uh, in some sense, not sober, not serious. Let me talk about the women for a moment. There are many women, I don't know of any here right now, but there are many women who wear what we call penguin skirts. You know what that means? They wear a skirt like this, very tight right here, so they walk like this. <laughs> like a penguin. And they can't move very fast. Uh, hello, how are you? Uh, Oh, oh, wait. <laughs> this is not a practical garment. The same thing, but this is the male equivalent. Skinny jeans. Ugh. This thing, I couldn't even fit these things on here. How do you wear this? <laughs> it's like you, these, are so, these are designed to where you can't bring them up to the waist level. What? And this is not the kind of clothing that you can't do much with skinny jeans. Like with me, my clothing is very free-flowing. I can do almost anything with these. But with that, there's no way you could do very hardcore construction stuff. There's no way you could run very, very fast. You would be smoked. You would be outrun by almost any person, certainly in Elijah. Go back to Luke chapter number 7. Give you another example. High heels, or what we better call whore heels on women. Why are you wearing... <laughs> What is the benefit of wearing high heels? There was one woman who used to come here. She's not here anymore, sadly. And she would wear high flip-flops <laughs> like this. And I would see she's like a discotheque operator. <laughs> and it was so funny. And it, what, that's not practical. I would see her going soul winning. And then she would, oh, the sandal falls off. And then she's moving so slowly. Hello. And she can't stop the person. Or men, like Mr. Jack right here, where he's wearing what, slippers or some kind of uh, uh, flip-flops. This is not how you're supposed to dress. If you dress like that when you go to the beach, if you dress like that when you're waking up in the morning, taking a shower, if you dress like that maybe as you walk around your house, okay, that's one thing. But to dress like that to church, to God's house, what? I remember my mother, we, we were at a church we first got saved in. She, uh, we were sitting, she was very observant of people. I really wasn't observant but she was observing people around her. And uh, we were sitting in the church service one time, and there was a guy who came dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, kind of like Jack, uh, and he was wearing flip-flops. And then he sat like this. He put his, uh, his foot out of the sandal, and he sat like this. And the whole service, he wasn't really paying attention. He was just picking his toes and then eating what was in his toes. <laughs> and she, like, she wanted to throw up, and she said, what kind of a fool is this? Is this how you come to church and uh, exposing your feet and like this? What? It's, it's, it's dumbfounding. It's stupefying. It's confusing. It is confusion. It's an abomination. 
and the way you're dressing is not right. Let us not be fools, let us be wise and dress practically. But I move on to my last point quickly, and that is that John the Baptist dressed plainly. Clothing should be frugal. Our clothing. Luke chapter number 7, verse 25. I want you to observe the simplicity of John's clothes. We saw earlier that John the Baptist dressed professionally. He was dressed to kill, as it were. There are those who dress to kill, like John. And then there are those who are dressed to kill, those who dress to kill. <laughs> Professional, practical, but finally, you're supposed to dress plainly. Observe the simplicity, Luke 7, 25. I like how Luke puts it. But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Did you go out to see a guy who is clothed like a king, who doesn't do any work, basically, who sits around doing nothing all day? Behold, they which are, notice the phrase, gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. So, Forget the idea that John the Baptist was wearing a rough garment. I'm not saying you can't wear cotton. I'm not saying you can't wear wool. That's not what's going on here. The point that it's being made here, especially what I'm making right now, is that John the Baptist dressed in an inexpensive way. He was not somebody who spent a lot of money on clothes. That's the point. If you will, John the Baptist was not a cashmere suit-wearing preacher. He was not a Joel Austin who dresses in a... $5,000 or $10,000 suit. That is not the kind of preacher that John the Baptist was. And uh, though it is very visible in his vestments, more clearly seen in his clothing, yet generally, John the Baptist lived a very self-denying, unassuming life. A life that was very modest, which can be seen most poignantly in the clothing he had. For example, the Bible says that John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine which means that he eschewed all of the luxuries of life. He cast them away, and he said he's going to deny himself and live a very self-denying lifestyle, even in the clothing that he was wearing. And therefore, who but a radically self-denying person would eat locusts and wild honey on a regular basis? What kind of a person would do that, that would make that their staple meal? Yet it was John who did this, because John the Baptist was the greatest man born of women and we must learn from him. John the Baptist did not dress haughtily, he dressed humbly. He did not dress ostentatiously, he dressed ordinarily. He did not dress richly, he dressed reasonably. And this is the kind of person that you should be, particularly we think today, when you come to God's house and church. Your clothing should be plain or modest, and your clothing should be frugal. Now, let me quickly guard against a misconception. I don't believe it's necessarily wrong for you to wear very expensive clothes on special occasions. But I will say that I think it is a sin for you to regularly wear very, very inordinately expensive clothing. Say, where is that in the Bible? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold, or pearls, and notice the last phrase, costly array. That means that women should not, and by extension men, women should not be wearing expensive clothes on a regular basis. They should not be wearing gold, silver, costly array on a regular basis, meaning that they should not be attired in very elaborate garments that cost crazy amounts of money and require a tremendous amount of maintenance. Or, if you don't like what Paul said, I give you Peter, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Somebody whose life is all about their clothing and that's what they spend all of their money on. When they get a, a raise at their job, they make sure that their wife is dressed very inor uh, inordinately expensively. Or the woman herself, if she gets a lot of money, she makes sure she sets aside half of it for my clothes. This is not the kind of Christian that God expects you to be. Note from also, if you don't like Peter, I give you James. Note what James says about the rich people. He says, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. 
it is a well-known fact that rich people oftentimes not only have a lot of clothes, but they have a lot of expensive clothes, a lot of expensive things, very costly. Their shoes are worth more than this entire building here. <laughs> I'm uh, using hyperbole, but the point here is they are so, like a king, they're gorgeously appareled. This was not, so did not John. And therefore, when God commands you to be sober, and we think sober in your clothing, that means that you're supposed to also be somebody who doesn't spend an insane amount of money on the clothing that you wear. Now, you might think that I'm destroying the building I had spent so long building this morning. You think Jesse is starting to preach against himself. He just got finished saying we're supposed to dress like John, not like Jack. We're supposed to dress very nicely and formally and not very casually and foolishly like this man over here. But that's actually not true. You see, you, if you think that, are making a mistake. You think, for example, that nice or expensive clothing is what the Bible talks of as costly clothing. That is not what it's talking about at all. Nice clothing or formal clothing is not equal to very expensive or very costly clothing. Proof, you can buy this exact clothing. You can buy this, this, that, the tie, the shirt, the trousers, the shoes, all of it. I'm a Muzungu, you know, I'm a white guy. So if I was buying stuff like this, it would cost me somewhere between one and 200,000 shillings. Like half, a quarter or a half month's wage for most Ugandans. But for you, especially if you can get deals and you're good at negotiating, you can probably get all of this for like 100K or 120K if you know where to go, if you know what people to talk to, and so on and so forth. So, oh, that's expensive. No, it's not very expensive. Now, by comparison to this, it is inexpensive. How much does this cost, right? <laughs> this get up right here. Probably a fraction of that, 10% or 20% of what would cost here. But that, that, that's not the point. The point is that there are people who don't dress like this merely, but they dress much more than this, you see? They dress in clothing that is extremely expensive. And on the other side of the spectrum, these, I'm told, I've never bought them, I'm renting this from someone else. <laughs> these are more expensive than these that I'm wearing right now. So it, the shoe is on the other foot. I'm sorry, the sandal is on the other foot, you know. <laughs> so this idea that, oh, it's more expensive. I mean, to a degree, because you're buying more articles of clothing uh, and because a couple of the things are very nice. But how much would you buy for a jumper or a jacket? How much? So the same thing with a suit jacket. So higher quality clothing does not have to be expensive. Though it is expensive, it is not expensive in itself and therefore it does not fall into that category. For example, someone might think, for example, that someone like myself, oh, you spend uh, maybe like eight or 10,000 shillings a day on what you eat. And they might think to yourself, that's very expensive. Well, maybe compared to the way most Ugandans eat, like two or 3,000 or four or 5,000 a day, but not compared to the way Americans eat, which would be the equivalent of maybe 50 or 100,000 a day. So uh, relative, expensive always is relative to some other thing. So relatively speaking, this is not expensive at all. And therefore, again, it doesn't fall into that category. It's an expansive uh, relative term. We ought to avoid dressing very, very, very expensively being somebody who literally dresses in clothing, one suit, for example, of like fake preachers in this country, one suit that they're wearing is worth more than a year's labor of anyone in this country uh, uh, who is, of course, poor. And so uh, that, that is sin. That's downright wickedness. Why? Because the Bible very clearly teaches us that we're supposed to disperse abroad and give to the poor. We're not supposed to be people who aggrandize ourselves and make ourselves bigger. When you buy clothing like that, even like this, when you buy very expensive clothing for the sake of kind of show or for the sake of people seeing you as very rich or whatever, rings and earrings and all this necklaces, just crazy amount of, they look like, a, like a, they went into a machine and they came out with all this metal all over them. When you do that, here's what you're actually doing. You're buying clothing for the sake of the clothing not for the, I'm sorry, for the sake of vanity, not for the sake of the clothing. Not so that I can be having food and raiment be there with content, but you're rather buying clothing so that you can display your vanity and display your wickedness and actually your evil, because uh, that would be a very strong testimony against you. It shall eat your flesh as it were fire. 
And secondly, that's the first thing. The second thing I'm going to say now about this is that, oh, I can't buy clothes because they're too expensive. Uh, we already saw that you're a hypocrite because there are things that you will do when you go to do them, you dress very nicely. But forget that for a moment. If you want to, you can dress nicely. Anybody in this church right now can dress like this. It might take you a couple weeks. It might take you a couple months to get to the full level. Uh, but to some degree, you should be moving towards being someone who's formal. And right now, you can fix a problem. How much does this shirt cost? How much does this tie cost? If you know how to do deals like 10 or 10K, 1 or 2K, right? So how, th that's nothing. You can literally buy something that makes you look very nice, a shirt and tie, and then later you get this in a couple months and you get that or whatever. That's the point. The idea here is that you should be moving towards being someone who's dressed serious, someone who takes God seriously. And I dare say that most people, if not almost everyone here, have the resources or the capacity to do this right now, to dress very nicely. You say, why don't you have female mannequins? Because most of the women dress pretty nicely at our church. This is greatly a rebuke to the men. But still, many women do dress in a very slobbish and a kind of not right way. Take it, therefore, as a lesson. Why, when it comes to church, do people not dress nicely, but when it comes to other things, they do? Why? Because the hardness of their hearts. Because they have hard hearts and they don't think that God is that important. They don't take God seriously. Oh, I take God seriously. No, you don't. Uh, how do you know? You, can you read my heart? No, I can read your clothes. And your clothes speak more than your words. Now, let me come to a couple uh, objections. Turn to James chapter 2 as I conclude. There are many objections that can be surfacing in the mind of someone sitting before me as to why they think that they have a special privilege not to be sober in their clothing. There are at least three, I'm gonna give you three, but there are at least three objections you could bring against what I'm saying, and I'm gonna answer all three of them right now. That way I leave no stone unturned, that way I'm giving you sound speech which cannot be uh, attacked, which cannot be refuted. The first one comes from Romans chapter 14. Someone might say something like this, how we dress in church in the scripture or how we dress generally in the scripture is unclear. It's a doubtful matter. It's something that we don't have wrong, a lot of light on from the Bible, about which scripture is largely silent. And therefore, who are you to impose and judge me as I come to church and dress in the way that I'm dressed? This is a Romans 14 issue. You're the legalist, they would say. You're the person who's putting upon me rules that are not right. And uh, that's the argument. Now, first of all, I just preached through Romans 14 and 15. I understand this passage very well. And this issue that I'm discussing today is not a Romans 14 issue. It is not a doubtful disputation. Let me remind you quickly what a doubtful disputation is in case you weren't here. A doubtful disputation or a dispute about things that are unclear, uncertain, or the Bible doesn't tell us is one where people disagree about practices or even doctrines disagree on usually practices, that in the Bible there is no precept, which means there's no law, and there's no principle. Did you get that? That means that there's no precept or clear law to tell us what to do, and there's no principle. Let me give you an example of a precept and a principle. Someone might say that having a tattoo is okay. It's okay to get a tattoo on your flesh. I can prove that that's, it's a Romans 14 issue. I can prove that it's not a Romans 14 issue in two ways. Number one, by precept. The Bible says in the book of Leviticus, not to print any marks upon you, I am the Lord. I can also prove it to you in principle from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have, you're not at your own, you're bought with Christ. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And therefore, both in principle and in uh, precept, you are sinning when you get a tattoo. Now, I freely admit to you what I'm saying today, there is no precept. There is no clear verse in the entire Bible that I know about that says that when you come to church, you must be dressed very formally. It doesn't say that. But today I've been showing you all the principles of the scripture that we're supposed to be serious when we come to church. And therefore, it is not a Romans 14 issue because there's a clear principle in the Bible that you're violating by dressing like Jack over here. And God does not accept you on that basis. You can't just wave your hand and say Romans chapter 14. False. You're somebody who is giving your way to sin uh, in a wicked and godless way. So therefore, according to the Bible, 
it is wrong for you to dress this way when you come to church, in principle. You say, well, the Bible doesn't tell us how to dress. Really? The Bible tells us that, for example, in Deuteronomy 22.5, not to be a cross-dresser. The Bible tells us that you're not supposed to expose your nakedness, your shame. The Bible tells us, we already read it, to be modest when you dress, that how exactly women should dress, literally. There's verses in the Bible that tell you how to dress and how to not dress. That means that the Bible does tell us how to dress and that the principles of Scripture do communicate to your clothing. They say, well, yes, men should dress as men and women as women, and that's fine and good, uh, and I guess suppose that people should be modest and so on when they dress, and women shouldn't uh, you know, expose themselves, and men should not be uh, uh, exposing themselves either. But uh, you're a legalist. You're simply saying that we have to, where does the Bible say, thou shalt put on a tie when you come to church as a man? Where does the Bible say you're supposed to put on a suit coat? Again, the Bible doesn't need to explicitly say anything about those things, because if the Bible had to explicitly say everything, then we would not know uh, certain things that we now know today. Let me give you an example. And this is an interesting example, but it's a government example. In America, when they were founding America, Hamilton and, and Franklin and, and Jefferson and whatever, they did not initially create what is called a Bill of Rights, which is this enumeration of your rights that you have in America and uh, they just made a constitution. And they were debating about making the Bill of Rights, the specific things, the, the freedom to, of religion, the freedom of the press, you know, right to bear arms and so on, unreasonable search and seizure, whatever. They were enumerating all of these ideas in the Bill of Rights later, but they didn't initially want to do it. Here's why. Hamilton said this, why would we have to put in a document that the government cannot infringe on someone's freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, or whatever, when we didn't give the government that power anyway? by the Constitution. But people didn't agree with his argument, and they said, yeah, you're probably right, but later on, people are going to say, hey, but you know, there's something it says about this, says about that, so they make a Bill of Rights. Now, there's problems in America. Because there's a Bill of Rights, if something is not in there, as today there are modern examples of things that ought to be in there, but they're not, they have to add it. But to add it, it's very difficult in America to add them. And in the Bible, you can't add things, nor take there from. Therefore, God does not really give us precepts. He doesn't give us laws only. He also gives us principles. So that from those principles, we can ourselves make laws. And therefore, this is a law. That you are supposed to be formal. Not law in the written sense, but law in the heart sense. The law as it were written on your heart. That you already know anyway. I am preaching to people who already believe what I'm saying. And if you don't believe that, why, when you came to church here, or why you come to church here dressed like Jack, do you feel bad? Why do you have this feeling like, I feel out of place? Way I, the way I'm dressed is not right. How I'm dressing is not good. The Bible says, to him that knoweth do good and doeth not to him it is sin. And while I'm on the subject of Romans 14, the fool who tries to attack what I'm saying with Romans 14, forgot to read the chapter. Because in Romans chapter 14, he says, every one of us must give account of himself to God. Now let's imagine that God right now said, give an account of how you're dressed in my house. Wouldn't you be trembling and fearful if you were dressed like Jack? Well, let's imagine God comes to John and he says, give an account of how you're dressed in my house right now. Oh, Lord, I dressed in a very formal, like your word tells me to be sober. Lord, I'm not wearing very expensive clothing. Lord, my clothing is practical. You know, I don't have my underwear exposed. My belt is on. I'm not wearing high heels. I'm not doing this. Say, well done, good and faithful servant. But if you're dressed like this, do you have any way to speak? Do you have any way to talk? Will you not fully be condemned? Therefore, it is not a Romans 14 issue. Because even in Romans 14, it says, think about this, does Jesus approve of my dressing? Does Jesus approve of the way that I am right now clothed? Would Jesus be happy to see me like this? Let me tell you what is a Romans 14 issue. Right now, John is dressed better than me, isn't he? Right? He's wearing this, bass coat. I don't wear those. If he were to come to me and say, Jesse, you're violating scripture. God says we're supposed to wear bass coats and you're not. Well, I would say I'm dressed formally and you're dressed formally, so there's nothing in the Bible that says we're supposed to wear this. Or he might come to me on a different day and say, Jesse, why are you wearing a blue shirt, right, on a Sunday? I did that. Why are you wearing a blue shirt? You should be wearing a white shirt. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Or John might go up to Solomon and say, what's this blue suit you have on, right? <laughs> you should be wearing a black suit. There's no disagreement here. We're both formal, right? So that, that's called a doubtful disputation. Or you see my tie. 
You say, your tie is not serious, Jesse. You don't love the Lord. You're not taking God seriously. What are you talking about? We're both dressed formally, right? You have a black tie. I like my tie better than yours, by the way. You have a black tie, and I have a colored tie. We're both dressed formally. That's the idea. So that would be, or, oh, Hot necktie, what about a bow tie? I think that when we come to church, we have to wear a bow tie. You can be fully persuaded of that in your own mind, but don't impose that on other people. Here's what I can impose on you, a tie, whether it be a necktie or a bow tie, because if you don't wear it, you're not formal, and therefore you're not sober, therefore you're not taking God seriously. I talked to the men in that regard. Therefore, that's the Romans 14 issue right there. But there's a second objection, James chapter 2, and uh, my time is out but I just want to give it to you. James 2, verse 2. God accepts me at church no matter how I dress. How dare you judge me? God has accepted me. They turn to James 2, verse 2. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect him that weareth the gay clothing or the expensive clothing, and you say unto him, sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and become judges of evil thoughts? So the argument goes. When we come to church, James is telling us, whether we dress in vile raiment, or whether we dress in gay or expensive clothing, happy clothing, very bright clothing, very expensive clothing, it doesn't matter. God doesn't care, and neither should the church leaders care. Neither should anyone in the church care. I should come to dress however I want and so on. That's what this verse is saying. Actually, that's not even close to the primary sense of what James is talking about. James is telling us not how to dress when you come to church. James is telling us that when people come to church, for ex- as an ex- illustration, they should be treated equitably. That means that if somebody is poor, not the dress, the, the clothing illustrates what he is. He's poor. And if somebody is rich, rich people can dress poorly and poor people can dress richly. But he's talking about the poor person and he's talking about the rich person. Usually rich people dress richly. Usually poor people dress poorly. And therefore he says, if a poor or a rich person comes to your church, then you must not show favoritism to them. Give the rich man the best seat in the house, and you go sit under the footstool over there. That's what he's saying. This has nothing to do with how you come dressed to church in the literal sense that we're talking about right now. Truly, if a saint came here dressed in vile raiment, That is, you came here dressed like a beggar on the street, but that was your only clothing, or that was what you had, or maybe you ran out of the room. I don't know why you would dress like this anyway, but you ran out dressed like this, and you came to church. You said, my house just burned down, and I lost all my clothes, but I needed to be in church on Sunday morning. Nobody would begin to disparage you. Nobody would begin to look down upon you, right? But when you're in peace and safety, and you dress like this. When you're in peace and safety and you're not dressing formally, uh, functionally and frugally, then I think you have, the, you, you have a sin. Okay. Here's a good principle that you can apply to yourself right now. I say, what, what, how do I take this sermon? When you come to church, how should you dress? Great question, right? Here's the best advice I can give you. Wear your best clothing to church. Just ask yourself, what is my best clothing? Now, if this is your best clothing, uh, you've got a lot of problems. <laughs> You need to go get better clothing. But wear your best clothing. And if you're serious about God, I believe within just a couple weeks from now, you'll be dressed like this guy, not like that guy. In fact, you'll, you'll, you'll bring down your head with shame to come into church like this, God willing. And you would never, not that you won't come to church, but that you will change and that you will actually get good clothes on that God is pleased with. Don't pretend to be a beggar when you're not. Don't pretend to be a poor person when you're not. So I'm poor, I don't make any money. Listen, you can easily get clothes. It's not hard, right? It's not that difficult for you to get clothing. Let me go to one last place, Matthew 23. Here's another objection. Some people say, well, God will accept me however I am. Let me give you an illustration why that's ridiculous. Let's imagine there were a man and a woman, and they're having their 10-year anniversary. They decide for their 10-year anniversary to go to a very expensive restaurant, very nice, very fine dining for their 10-year anniversary. The woman is dressed in a beautiful garment. She goes and gets there before the man who's rushing from work to get there. He arrives, and he's dressed like Jack. Let me ask you one question. The woman, who is the wife, will she accept Jack? Yes. But will she be pleased with Jack? The answer is no. 
So just because God accepts you, it's out of grace. It's out of his love and it's out of his mercy that you have not died dressing like this. But it's not that God pleased with you. It, just because lightning did not strike you when you walked out two weeks ago, one month ago, whatever, doesn't mean God's not angry at you. Doesn't mean that you're not in sin. God might have accepted you in a way of grace, but right now you need to say, Lord, I'm going to do my best for you. Lastly, Matthew 23, verse 25, the, the objection is this. God is not concerned with how we dress. He's concerned with our heart. That's completely false. Matthew 23, 25, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You see, the person says, Jesus is attacking the Pharisees who are looking very nice on the outside, looking very smartly, as they say here, but inside they're wicked, inside they're evil. Verse 26, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Oh, sorry, I wasn't supposed to read that verse because it totally breaks apart your narrative. Jesus is not saying that we're not supposed to be nicely dressed or that God doesn't care about your clothing or whatever, the outside. Men look on the outward appearance. Therefore, if we dress for God, yes, well, God doesn't need me to dress. He does. He wants you to. In the Bible, he tells people what to wear. But forget that. The Bible says men look on the outward appearance. So if you want to present yourself to the people of God and to uh, the assembly of God, you should be dressed well. God does mind it because throughout the scripture, he shows us that he minds it by telling us what kind of things we should wear. Here, again, I just read verse 26. Jesus is not saying don't clean the outside. He's saying clean the outside after you clean the inside. He's not telling you not to fix the way you dress, as it were. That's one of the applications. He's talking about something else. He's not telling you not how to dress. Rather, he's telling you how you're supposed to fix your life. First, you fix the inside. You get your heart right. And then you fix the outside. And listen to me. If your heart is right with God, you'll be dressed up formally at church. If your heart is right with God, then you'll be dressed up very nicely at church when you come to God's house. And, you know, the warning is well taken. I don't want a church of whitewashed tombs. I don't want a church of people who come dressed like John, but they live like Jack. I don't want people who come to church dressed up really nicely, but then as soon as the service ends, they run out the door, no soul winning, no Bible reading, no weeping and mourning for sin, no righteousness, no holiness, no godliness. Oh, they're sober, they're serious, but they're only serious in clothing, not in heart. Yes, I take the warning very well, but let me tell you something. Which would you rather have? This is a great question to ask. Would you rather have a righteous, godly, soul-winning church that maybe don't know how to dress very nicely at church? Or would you rather have a church full of people, full of people to the brim, who are dressed just like this, dressed powerfully, perfectly, but they're leading a double life, and they live wickedly, and they do all manner of evil behind closed doors? Which one would you rather have? Clearly, you would rather have the first one. But let me ask you another question. Why do we have to choose? Why is it an either or? Why can't it be a both and? Why can't you live a righteous life? Why can't you be a soul winner and so on and dress nicely when you come to church? Why can't it be both? Forget us. Why can't our head, Jesus, have both? Isn't that what he deserves? Doesn't that, is that what God ought to get? Isn't that kind of service he demands in Ephesians 5, as it were, without spot, without wrinkle, being presented to him, being at least in one way dressed in a right way? Therefore, I say, enough of this mockery of the maker or the contempt of the Christ or the spurning of the spirit as we gather together the assembling of the saints you should decide right now, in your, as you sit in your chair right now, decide, when I come to God's house on Sunday morning at 11 a.m., when I come to God's house on Sunday evening at 6 p.m., when I come to God's house on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., I am going to be dressed well like John the Baptist. I'm going to, there might be exceptions. Maybe on a Wednesday evening you're rushing from work and so, or from school you can't change quickly. That's fine because it's an exception, but it's not the rule. The rule is that you dress well. And you know what? Not just at church, but everywhere. That you would dress, I'm not saying you have to dress like this all the time, but I'm saying you don't look like this, okay? May God help us. If you go soul winning like this, people would laugh at you. 
People would mock you. No, don't bring contempt upon the name of Christ, but rather go out, live a sober life, have formal, functional, and frugal attire, be professionally dressed, be practically dressed, and be plainly dressed. Be dressed as a Baptist ought to dress. Awake, awake, put on strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning sad and sorrow of heart because of all of the iniquity that we have committed. Myself included, Lord, I've not always been perfectly formal for church, but Lord, I pray that you'd forgive us for all of our iniquity and all of our wickedness, and instead, Lord, that this church would begin to take you seriously. Lord, that you would right now move upon the hearts of everybody here, and they would make a decision in their heart not to spurn the word of God, not to uh, ignore what's being preached, but Lord, to actually have a real sincere change which can only come about by your spirit. And may the God of all grace be with them. I pray, Father, that you would bless us all as we seek to serve you in a sober manner. In Jesus' name, amen.